why did you write this book, Blood, Bones, and Butter? And can you also tell us a little bit about what the title means? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, well, the title is uh, Blood, Bones, and Butter. I do, in fact, handle those things on a regular basis every day. So um, it's not uncommon to find me in an apron with sort of meat blood all over it and my hands and some bones or something buttery. But for me, it has connotative value of, um, well, blood kind of a bloodline and clan and family and um, bones, I guess was uh, bones, making one's bones and maybe a few bones to pick here and there. And, <laughs> um, and then butter loosely was all the sort of sweet, creamy, good stuff of mm -hmm. food, family, life. Um, that was the idea. Yeah. You mentioned family a few times there, and one thing that I really liked, there are several mother figures and, and mentor <laughs> figures in your book, from your own mother to Marie and Misty and Alda, who was very important in the end. Um, what did cooking with these women mean to you? Was it some you know, need for love or nurturing or acceptance? Probably, in hindsight, or if I went to an anal analyst, <laughs> that's what they would say if I laid down on the couch and they would say, you have a deep craving to recreate family. <laughs> and I guess they would be right. <laughs> but I didn't really know that that's what I was doing. I think, um, well, my mother's a huge influence on me in my cooking, for sure, and how I eat. And then um, Misty in Michigan, who I met when she was running a catering company, um, that was great because I'd been working in catering for so long, doing really crappy food that didn't mean anything to me. Mm -hmm. um, and she kind of re-triggered um, uh, me to go back to what I had grown up eating and the way I wanted to cook. So she gave me sort of permission or the opening, the door opening to uh, step away from all that I'd been doing professionally and find out who I was as a cook and um, to revert to what I'd grown up with. Because my mom was a very, very, very good cook. More than, um, more than amateur. Like she could have been professional, I guess has been at certain times in her life, but you know, not just like, your mom makes really good soup. <laughs> um, very good cook. So I was glad to sort of revert to what I had grown up with. And Alda, I mean, I think she held the promise of family as I hoped to recuperate it um, from the one I had sort of lost had fallen apart from when our family imploded from divorce, etc. So I saw in her certainly, you know, an opportunity to kind of right. recreate family or insert myself into a family that wasn't exactly mine, but if you squinted, it would work, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to talk about being a badass because you've lived, <laughs> you've lived a pretty crazy life. I mean, it's badass to be 17 years old slinging drinks in one of the craziest bars in New York doing drugs. It's badass to open a restaurant in this part of town when it was not great. Um, and yet at a certain point in your life, it's like being a badass stopped being that, that awesome title and you aspired to maybe more of a sense of peace. I was faking badass <laughs> until okay. I eventually became quite confident in my true strength and that's when I no longer had to act so badass in a big blustery way. It's probably I didn't something that a lot of women like deal with. So now I am badass. At least you feel you have to hear badass. Know but once, it. Like, once you reach that level then you're like I don't have to fake it anymore. You know right. we've talked about this what is it the imposter syndrome mm -hmm. or like the feeling that you really have to yeah. like fake it till, fake you, it make till it. you make it. And mm -hmm. once you make it maybe you can just relax it's a little such bit. A delicious position to be in when you finally make it and you don't have to be so blustery and spend so much energy trying to fake people out into making them think you're one thing that you're not. And I think mm -hmm. now it's actually very badass to say, mm, I'm a little tender and okay. I need some help and okay. I can't do everything by myself, but I can do a lot. And yeah. um, now that I know I can do a lot, it's nice to say, do you mind just doing that for me? Or <laughs> <laughs> and the subject of being uh, a chef and a woman comes up quite often in the book, and then later on being a sh female chef and a mother. I was wondering if you could give us your perspective on exactly what, the, the, what does that mean? There are, there are contradictions in that, and there are also connections. I didn't want to actually write an essay about being a woman chef, um, but I also couldn't imagine how I could write a book and not include the topic somehow. And I. Um, 
instead just decided to tell a story um, that you would catch everything you need to know about what it's actually like to be a female mm -hmm. chef and trying to have a family and children and run a business. I'm also the owner of a business. So those are two full-time jobs. And then the family, that one's mm -hmm. a third job. So instead of saying, young, future chefs, women, right. here's what I'd like to do is cheer you on. Or I, I don't want to do that. I just want to say, this is what it's going to look like. And not in an essay form or in a um, lecture form. Right. I just want to mm -hmm. tell you this story. So that's what that chapter really was. Is Okay, here's me going to a conference, and here's what it took for the right. for me to pull that off. I had to not see my children for a whole day. I had to get up at four o'clock in the morning. I'd gone to sleep at one thirty. My shirt was dirty. Um, you know, I'm chefing by phone, trying to describe mm -hmm. a recipe to a sous chef back at the restaurant. I mean, it's just a freaking disaster. But you know, you live through it, and um, right. and hopefully, <laughs> women will continue to enter the industry. <laughs> you kept quiet at the conference, though. I did. And, I got, and and yeah. and you found your voice in the book. So I'm wondering, did that that um, the yeah. perspective come later for you? No, it was, that may be one of the bones um, to mm -hmm. pick part of the. Yeah. I I left that conference regretting that I hadn't spoken, but I got so um, caught up in I don't know an adrenaline rush, or I was sort of, because the other women on the panel were. Right. I think they had a very different purpose. They were there just to cheerlead. And mm -hmm. they gave these big, generic, pep talky type rally um, bits of advice. And they weren't even really giving it. They were just sort of like, you can do it. Yeah. And they spoke to young women entering the industry um, from the perspective of women who had been in the industry for some right. 30 and years. And already reached that them. level of success. We so I thought there was such an incredible disconnect between who they were talking to and what they were saying. Mm -hmm. So I was just sort of um, shocked or silent, and I didn't want to be controversial, and I didn't want to, um, as women are wont to do, I didn't want to have conflict. Right. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to be on the panel like, yeah, this is great. But meanwhile, I was like, this is so bad. This is not <laughs> telling the truth. We have to tell these young girls the truth. <laughs> and so I ended up writing the chapter of everything I wished I had yeah, told them yeah, later. And yeah. um, and it's funny because now I'll reach more women I through this so. than mm -hmm. I would have the women in the in the room. Yeah. Right. On the subject of your career, it felt like from the book that there was kind of an accidental quality to it. Not to undermine all the hard work you put in, but it seemed like early in your life, professional cooking kind of just fell into it. It almost happened by chance. In the same way that, that prune almost seemed to be an accident. You know, you came across it, you fell in love with it. Do you think that's how careers are typically made? You just kind of capitalize on the opportunities that arise? I think they can be, but um Actually, I think a lot of young people are um, driven to pick your path and stick to it and don't veer off. And um, I'm definitely the poster child for meandering and everything will work out. And um, if it feels right in the moment, then it must be right and it'll satisfy your soul. And um, yes, it's everything is accidental for me. Or not accidental, but um, inadvertent. There's another scene in your book that's awesome where you talk about and this particularly resonated with me. You talk about taking on the, the eight burner stove for a brunch ship, or like mm -hmm. attacking it like right. a foe, right? <laughs> like a bout. Yeah, like you yeah, know, a, a boxing match, mm -hmm. right? Um, having managed a restaurant and been in a brunch ship, I know how crazy it is, but, but you're up for the challenge, right? So you're, this is an equal match. And I think that that's a really, another really cool point in maybe any woman or any person's career when you're, you're as good as you need to be. Mm. The, the particulars of restaurant industry, I think, were you mentioning that earlier, that you have to be sort of driven to manage chaos. You have an mm -hmm. impulse toward yeah. it. That mm -hmm. um, this is not an industry where your desk, uh, your work will be waiting for you on your desk on Monday if you happen to be sick on right. Friday. Or um, you have to enjoy work and harnessing that incredible chaos and all the things, the vagaries mm -hmm. of the industry itself. So in that sense, it's, I would never encourage people to come into this industry who feel this way, um, who feel like, I love to cook. <laughs> That's what Anthony Bourdain <laughs> is always saying cook, in his books. Do not, do not <laughs> come into this industry. You should just stay home and in love cooking at home mm -hmm. and have dinner parties and um, 
But is there something immensely satisfying about that, about organizing that chaos or getting it all together or surviving not, that? There is, of course. I mean, the satisfactions are, are multiple. There's not only organizing the chaos, and for me, I'm very um, into providing a systematic and sane and functioning and healthy workplace mm -hmm. so that people don't walk around here like, what are the expectations? And where's the blender? You know, I like to put order mm -hmm. in, but also it's very nice to be on the team and not working solo alone all the time, which right. is a very nice yeah. um, antidote and contrast to writing, which you know, you do so, it's such a lonely endeavor mm -hmm. and often, for me at least, a self-savaging one. Your doubts are constantly right here mm -hmm. yelling at you the whole time about right. what a stupid bore you are. and so. <laughs> It's nice to be on a team, you know, yeah. where you're in a lively setting and we're all moving the food to the past and, you know, are you up in 20 seconds on that lamb? Okay, so I'm going to come with my vegetable and um, that's, teamwork is really part of it too. Yeah. It feels good. So we have a reader question for you. Oh yeah. And that question is, she says that your book is both succulent and <laughs> gritty, yeah. so if it was a dish, what would it be? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. That is good. Mm, probably the marrow bones, the roasted marrow bones, um, which are indeed succulent, but um, maybe a little hard for some people. Like they're a challenge. Right. And that person has really um, she gets named, you <laughs> named exactly like almost the whole. Shtick. It's, yeah. no, it's not a shtick. I'm not a shtick, but right. that's very me. There's, yeah. um, it's a little abrasive and a little consumable too. Right. 